Welcome to the Strategy Mom Podcast. Tune in for everything you need to know to stay in the know regarding the automotive industry. Here's your host, Jason Harris. Hey, what's going on, Podcast Nation? It is Jason Harris here, and thank you for joining me in another episode of Strategy Mob. Today, I have two amazing guests, two powerhouse individuals in our automotive industry. I have the one and only Carrie Wise and the oh so famous Lori Foster. <laughs> Ladies, thank you so much for taking the time to jam with me today. No so problem. Good to be here, Jason. Yeah, glad to be here, especially with Lori. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of fun. I know there's going to be some amazing knowledge bombs today. There's going to be a lot of laughs because I know the three of us together, we, we can go in all kinds of different directions here <laughs> with today's topic. But you know what, for, every, for the handful of people that don't know who you two ladies are and how you got started in the industry, I thought it'd be fun to kick off today's podcast with a couple origin stories. So uh, Carrie, I'll start with you. How did you get started in this crazy little world we call the automotive industry? Well, I have been in the business for, I guess it's been 22 years. I'm just going to start saying 20 plus because I feel like you start to age yourself after a certain amount of time and that just sounds better, 20 plus. Um, but I started uh, on the vendor side at, at J.D. Power and Associates. I worked mostly on the OEM side um, on, in our automotive division, um, working on projects related to marketing, automotive marketing and automotive retail. Um, and then kind of got the got bit by the the auto retail bug um, while at JD Power and Associates, and we did a lot of projects that uh, helped OEMs and dealers from a, a, a retail improvement standpoint. So mystery shopping dealers, helping them dissect what's really happening from a consumer standpoint, um, and eventually moved on to Edmunds.com in the digital space, uh, working in in training, working. Um, on the field side from a dealer training standpoint and marketing as well, and then eventually moved over to TrueCar and um, really joined TrueCar at a time where we were working on our reputation with dealers. I took a, a VP of dealer relations job when most people thought I was insane um, to join TrueCar, <laughs> um, but you know, made a lot of progress with the dealer community. When I joined, we had 10,000 dealers. We have 16,000 now in, in five years. So i um, really proud of my work at, that I, at, I've done and my team at, at TrueCar, but but we still have a lot of work to do. So um, 22 years later at, at TrueCar, I lead our communications. So all of our industry facing work, our PR, um, I speak at a lot of conferences and, and I love this business. You know, bit by the bug is probably like one of the best ways to explain it because it really is because it kind of gets under your skin a little bit and then it, it never comes out. Like it's just, it's just, you know, once you're in, you're in and you're not, you're in, out, you know, yeah. um, that was my best Godfather impression, by the way, it was horrible. <laughs> um, Lori, <laughs> for yourself, how did you get started in the automotive industry? Well, first of all, since I'm Foster Strategies, I'm going to offer you one. Keep your day job, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jason, glad you asked. And thanks. It's just so much fun to be here with you and Carrie. So, um, I'm listening to Carrie and I'm listening about her career arc and I'm thinking about mine. And although I had a, a lot of years as being a mom under my belt by that point, it was 22 mm -hmm. years ago. I started in the industry after I had to take my mom skills to the next level. And if there was one industry that needed a mom <laughs> to step in and say, what in the world? Clean your room. <laughs> Why are you doing that? <laughs> Sit in the corner. Um, so I entered automotive the way a lot of people do, selling cars. And I very quickly, because of my background in construction with my former partner and with being a mother and having to be very organized and being the chief volunteer for everything, the church pianist, you didn't know that. Um, so how do you like that? So um, suddenly I approached, I approached this business, even though I wasn't nuts about um, what I was doing and exactly what was happening there, I could see a better future and I could see also at the same time a lot of people that needed a lot of help and deserved it a lot of people were coming um, uh, not to sound um, too, too sad here but uh, with a, maybe a broken wing maybe something hadn't gone right and so maybe though with a little bit of you know love and care and support and nurturing so as I started to do that even in my role which I saw was costing me probably a few sales deals a month, but was also making me better. 
I then pursued management in automotive, very quickly moved through all of that, um, moved from Michigan to the East Coast to Boston to see if I was good at this business or just good in Michigan. And then Chicago and Michigan again. And then um, here's where Carrie and I's lives started paralleling before we even knew it. I was a national speaker and trainer for cars.com for three years doing stages all over the country, most of them just really nice places, um, some of them as nice as NADA or JD Power, some of them, the, uh, the dealership break room or a company break room because everybody forgot the meeting was happening. So you never got too full of yourself. Um, and what I saw everywhere by literally speaking to thousands and thousands of people a year is I saw that those same needs that I saw clear back when I was selling cars were not just present in my dealership or Michigan or Boston or Chicago. It was a, it was permeating the whole industry. So then I went on to AutoNation where I did variable operations across the country for almost five years. And then now I'm here. So I've started my own company to take all of that with my own blueprint. Because what I saw is even if I worked for nice companies, the, um, the uh, processes weren't complete. The thought that needed to go into something wasn't um, as fully developed as it needed to be. And uh, I saw the disconnect between corporate saying what to do versus what was getting done um, and the how and the why and all of that. So now I can draft it all from beginning to end. And um, so luckily back to Carrie, we were able to finally meet a handful of years ago even after people had told both of us, you need to meet this person and um, we're out there kind of. So, and then when we met, we, we discovered we were twin sisters separated at birth. <laughs> we literally have matching outfits. It's not, it's not a joke. We, we, we buy the same clothes. That and is just too cool. Out. Yeah. So, so that's where I am today. I'm more passionate than ever and really appreciate the work you're doing, Jason. And of course you carry, because it, it couldn't be a better time to give dealers and vendors better insights and solutions and partnership, right? So thank you both for what you're doing because I consider you both great friends, um, but we met because of business, because you were so great at what you do. And so then the friendship ensued, so thank you. Yes. You know what, as, as big as this industry is, it really isn't. Uh, we are so, such a, a small, tight niche family. And you know, when, when this all went down, I mean, I don't, I think everybody was kind of prepared for some type of contingency, but I don't think anybody, I mean, anybody could have ever been prepared for what happened. I mean, I remember the recession, it was six to nine months and things started mm -hmm. to slowly fall apart, break apart and stuff like that. And this was two weeks, bam, you know, depending on where you were in the country, things just shut down. And now I'm seeing that it may be starting up again. So yay, that's fun. But you know, with all that said and everything negative that happened, I will have to applaud our industry. Because an industry that <laughs> just historically does not change <laughs> and does not change quickly, all right, had to adapt and evolve literally in some cases overnight. And I, you know, was fearful that our industry just wasn't going to do it. But I was just dumbfounded as, as we did. And so many dealerships and dealer groups and vendors, everybody just was like, this is what's going to happen. This is what it is. Let's let's evolve. Let's move on. And that's kind of what I would like kind of our conversation to be about today, because I don't want that to stop. You know, I mean, the last 60 days as an industry, I think we changed more in 60 days than we had probably six to 10 years prior to that combined, you know, and I just don't want to see that stop. So I, I, I got a couple different topics, guys, but, you know, I, I've been using the word pivot but i want to stop using that word because you know how words become buzzwords in our industry and no one mm -hmm. likes to hear it um carrie you when we were talking earlier before camera you, you used the word evolve and i think that kind of makes so much sense because that's really what we did we evolved we evolved quickly but i still think there's a lot more evolving to do and um i think real quick what we saw during the last three or four months we saw that cream really rise to the top you know, you know what I mean? Like it was it, real fast. You got to see who were the real leaders within your organization. You know, and if you were a vendor or if you're a dealership, you saw real quick who the true leaders are. And I want to make sure that we are continuing to evolve those leaders and create new leaders. And I kind of want to get your guys' thoughts on that. Um, Lori, I'll start with you. And then Carrie, I kind of ask you the same question. You know, how do we continue to evolve our leadership uh, staff? And how do we continue to attract new leadership? 
Yeah, great question. As I plug my phone in that wants to go down, that's one thing we all need to do is <laughs> ABCs, always be charging. Um, yeah. so, so I think that um, as I even think about the word evolve, I use it a lot with our processes. I always say is it effective, efficient, easy, enjoyable, and evolving. Evolving has to is the most important cog in that wheel. But as you were saying um, all of this, Jason, I'm reflecting, I jotted down a note here that 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 instant oats, that drive-through change that we did it quickly, doesn't always have the roots and the legs that we're going to need. And so, and we even think, I'm just even thinking about like the process and the expense and the work involved and the decisions made to buy organic milk versus non-organic milk. I invite you all to go grocery shopping or Instacarting, whatever you like. And I want you to take a look at the expiration label because the pasteurized milk, the cheap version, which I kind of correlate to the, the quick access, that milk is expiring in seven to 10 days. Your organic milk is four to six weeks, maybe even eight. And so things that are worth doing are worth doing well. It costs a little bit more, even with the digital solutions and the ideas that you have about, well, we really hustled. There's more investment, more planning, more strategy to take this, like you said, not just to stop right here, but to keep going. But right now, all we have is proof that they grabbed more gallons of milk out of the, out of the thing. We, what we don't know is do they have a plan for long term that goes far beyond an expiry date? that goes far beyond that one leader or a, f a small team pushing. Because I still see so much of this was done. I was just on another webinar this morning. I know there's another, hard to believe, but I was on another one this morning. I'm like, we did most of that, not through aha moments of enlightenment and engagement and training our people and resetting pay plans and metrics. We did it through hours and muscle and adrenaline, and we did it because only because our back was against the wall, not because the mindset had truly shifted. So I know while some dealers might have had those moments, my concern is they're not lasting. And so we always see this EKG with automotive. So we just had a good month. So you watch what happens this month. Now that we had a good month, you watch that EKG this month. Now, I'm not saying we're going to sell less cars, but I think we're going to lose some profit on those cars this month. And I don't say that because I want that to happen, but to know these students of the industry, the, these people that need our help, I, um, patterns repeat themselves. And so I want more for them, but that includes depth and commitment and mindset shift. And again, role reclarification, pay reclarification, um, changing the objectives. And, uh, and we can talk more on this in a minute, but that's what I... That's what I'm seeing right now with this instant evolution. No, your your number is right. It was it was kind of a forced evolution, and it's kind of like we won the battle, but the war has only begun. Um, and it's like we kind of got over that 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 hump, but you know we need to continue to evolve. And Carrie, you talk to hundreds of dealers, if not thousands of dealers, you've met so much of their leadership team and managers. And, and I'm sure you're probably calling on some of them finding out maybe some of them aren't even there anymore. And then maybe new ones are popping up. You know, I mean, you were, Lori, you were, you mentioned patterns earlier. I mean, Carrie, I'm sure you see patterns right now in some of the leadership and management that are really crushing it. And I'm just kind of curious, what are some of the patterns you're seeing on those dealerships that are really crushing it right now? Yeah, well, and let me just touch first on something Lori, Lori said about, you know, our backs being up against the wall. And I think it, it, got, it comes down to human nature, if you think about it. Um, think about addiction, not to, not to completely change the topic, but people don't change until they hit rock bottom, right? Like in addiction, in the world of addiction, they don't change. And so I do think it is human nature and maybe even more human nature in auto retail to wait until there is pain to change. Um, now, that being said, you, you could change because you were forced to, but that means you could still catch up and, and, and really understand that this is a lifestyle that I, that I want to keep right? Not just because I had to, this is a lifestyle that I want to keep. And so I am hopeful that there is a segment of retailers and I have talked to some who were somewhat surprised that some of the things they did when COVID struck actually worked. 
Some of the things they said were impossible, um, like providing information to consumers online up front, right? <laughs> um, the digital retailing, delivering cars, all that stuff that we claimed were impossible or didn't work all of a sudden overnight, we were able to implement and work. And so I think because of that, the results will, will, will cause some of these retailers for, for it to stick. And I think I'm with you, uh, Lori, that many are doing it for the wrong reasons. They're not bought in and they're going to go back to, to, their, to their old ways. Um, I think to answer your question, Jason, what we saw was that there was a smaller segment of dealers that were ready for this. They've been talking about this for a long time. And when, when they were talking about this at conferences or amongst their peers, they were looked at like the Jetsons, right? They were looked at like they were crazy, like, like you know, they were in a whole nother world and they're laughing right now, right? They're laughing because they were adopting remote retailing practices and offering that path to purchase well before everybody else. I, say, I would say the majority of dealers though fell in that camp of they had their toe in it. Maybe they were doing a trade offer on their website. Maybe, you know, you could get a car delivered, but they didn't really emphasize that too much in their, in their marketing. And I would say that was probably the majority of dealers that just had to quickly adapt out of pure necessity. And, and like I said, I'm surprised to see some of them. I think it's going to stick because at the end of the day, I think the consumers are going to drive a lot of a lot of the evolution. Um, I never purchased groceries online until COVID happened. Was not interested in it. Didn't matter to me. I actually thought going, driving to the grocery store was much more convenient. Well, guess what? I did so after COVID. And even when the world returns back to normal, I'm still going to keep some of those habits. And so if you're a retailer and you want to satisfy me, you're going to have to offer that. And I see, I see the same thing in automotive retail. I think that there's going to be consumers that tried this new way of buying a car and there's aspects of them that they're going, they liked, and they're going to demand retailers to offer that going forward. I'm a hundred percent with you on that, Carrie, you know, but, but I understand though, for that change to stick, I mean, to really grab hold because, you know, you guys both, you know, nailed, nailed it, hit it, hit it on the head, you know, and the fact that we were just up against the wall, we had to do something. Mm -hmm. All right. So as an industry, we had to do something. So we made, so we made changes, you know, but Lori, you mentioned earlier, you know, about the mindset, you know, for this to fundamentally shift and continue to stay this way. And Carrie, you saw with the people that already have the mind sh that that mindset, that might that, that that this is how I'm going to do. I'm gonna put the customer at the center of my buying process or selling process. I'm gonna put the customer at the center of my marketing efforts. You know, and but it, but it comes down to that mindset. So I mean, Lori, can, like how our backs up the wall. We made the change. We fought the couple rounds. We came out okay, but now we're going into you know round two, three, and four. You know how do we how do we change that mindset and continue to push forward? This correlates to the work that I'm doing very often with both dealers and vendors because what we've got to do first of all is give everybody an opportunity, like Carrie said, to catch up, but not just catch up to understand the project at hand. Um, even if it's something as massive as like the way we conduct business, <laughs> but like, like get everybody in the room and throw the ideas out and give everybody a voice in the conversation. Then whatever it is, direction we choose to go, it's awareness for everyone. And awareness doesn't mean I heard there was a meeting. Awareness means I was in the meeting. Then we go for alignment. Alignment, um, nothing's going to happen if you don't have alignment at that point. Then you start to set some targets, um, some early stage baking in reality. And then um, what becomes very important then is all of your communications internally and externally. Like we're doing these things now and internally and here are the expectations that we have of everyone and to the customers even. We're doing something, you know, things differently now and here we are. Because then the next thing, and this is a little deeper into the pool, but then we've really got to take a look at who what are the roles that we have at the store, right? And that's a whole category all into its own. Role cl reclarification. We need to look at pay structures, right? Because when all of the KPIs have changed, um, we've got to look at what are we paying and for what and when, and, what's the, and what is the new normal in the midst of this new normal. And then we want to look at also the very next thing, 
we want to take a minute and just say, okay, how well of a job are we going to do creating and developing these people towards this? Like, what's our commitment? And so like even new things like talking about things now, like what's the proper percent of contracts that should be even sent or reviewed prior to the customer arriving? What's the um, proper number of customers that our people can be interacting with? We and, not, and not just number of customers they're interacting with, but what should that interaction look like? I got a call on that the other day. I'm like, and we could go on about that later, but like, what does that look like? And what are we saying? Like, what about all those scripts everybody paid so much money to get? They're done. <laughs> what about that whole mentality of if we're still managing to saying Jason, but they're not here, they're not serious until they're here. We've got to rewire the manager's mindsets and we've got to also pay those managers accordingly. And then what about the number of times managers got involved with customers wherever they were virtually which are real customers or in the showroom, which are real customers. But so we need to see a cadence of different reporting metrics happening. So I think until we start to really like rethink our whole ecosystem, these other things, I used to work for a guy that just said there's splotches of things on the wall. They're not a cohesive strategy. So planning, awareness, and then commitment, and then go forward and know that you're going to make some mistakes, but know that you're going to regroup get back to alignment and make adjustments and keep going and evolving. No, you know what? I, I feel like in the past, we've been able to kind of blindly take shots in the dark and eventually hit something. And, 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 and that was enough to kind of just continue to keep the ball moving. But that's not really necessarily the case anymore. Um, I mean, both Carrie and, and Lori, I mean, you guys have seen the dealerships that have really, you know, didn't skip a beat and just was able to kind of just ride through this storm, you know, were the ones that for a very long time prior to this had put the customer at the center of everything. You know, it's, it's the, it's the why they developed their staff, you know, Lori, to your point, it's the why they hired who they're hiring. It's their point. And, and Lori, I'd like to kind of get your thoughts on like the marketing side. Like, look in the past, when it comes to marketing, huge discounts, low lease rates i mean that's literally been our our message for like i don't know the last 50 60 years you know it's like but how do we put the customer and how do we evolve our marketing efforts to put the customer at the center of that carry your thoughts well yeah i'm i'm, I'm shaking my head because you were talking about some of the players that were ahead ahead of this and they were doing some of these things and some of these processes before they had to Right. And I think there were a couple things. One, they had the long game in mind. And a lot of times when you look at automotive retail, we do things all for short term gain. But what can I do today that is going to result in a sale tomorrow or maybe next week, but no further than that? Right. And so we do things even from a profitability standpoint that are very short term in nature. You know, I always like when people make fun of some of these companies out there that aren't profitable yet, but are doing some revolutionary things. I'm not going to name them because I don't want any hate mail sent to me. But let's just remember that Amazon didn't make profit for their first nine years in a business. Okay. And they're laughing right now at all of us who were making fun of them when they weren't making profit. A lot of times when you change um, a business model, when you're the first to do something, it actually isn't profitable on day one. It takes some time to refine, particularly when you're creating a trend. And I think what's challenging in our business, and even when COVID struck, is that we tend to be more competitor focused than we are consumer focused. We tend to wanna to know what other dealers are doing. And I think we are at a fork in the road right now where we really need to be looking at what non-automotive is doing, right? Because they've been in this virtual world much longer than most in automotive retail. When it comes to leadership, we need to be looking at what non-automotive is doing. And I say that as someone who loves our business, but we're, we're behind the curve here on the virtual remote retailing, all of that front relative to other, other industries. And, and, and I think that, that that's go going to be key. And the, and the other thing is just from a, an efficiency standpoint, I think that what I have seen, I think is the blessing of COVID in automotive retail is all of a sudden being efficient is become more important, right? Than the number of leads you're getting and all of that. 
your marketing efficiency, which I think you're going to jump to next, making sure I'm spending money on marketing that actually yields, you know, results. Um, and then people, your efficiency when it comes to people. I've always asked this question and just shoot me everyone, but how come there's so many people that get paid on one deal? Think about that. How many people in a dealership get paid off of one sale? Think about that. Now, all of a sudden with COVID and furloughs and layoffs and things like that, everybody had to get more out of individuals. People had to take on more, more jobs. We all of a sudden started to look at every individual and say, how do we get the most out of this person's time? Because we are forced to. And I think that's something we should have always been focused on is efficiency of people, marketing and, and process. Well, it all comes down to like, how do we do more with less? And, you know, um, over the last few months, we've had to do more with less. And, you know, I think a fair amount of dealerships are going to take that to heart and they're gonna own that. And they're gonna to continue to ask themselves those questions. Like, does a customer really need to interact with four different people before they make a purchase? Right. Really? Like, A, is that efficient? Like, you're, to, your, to your point, Carrie. And B, is that is that really what the customer wants? I mean, does yes. the customer want to be balanced from this person to this person to that person? I, I don't really think so, right? But but I agree with you. I think moving forward, you know, the, the theme is not necessarily a, a new fancy gadget of, of, of uh, technology or marketing message or a, a magic diet pill that's going to help me, you know, become more profitable. It's like we are going to have to process our way to profitability, and that at the at the core of that is efficiencies. And one of the biggest expenses we have next to our staff is our marketing. You know, so it's like how do we how do we become more efficient with those marketing dollars? Carry your thoughts. You got to, you got to, number one, understand who you're targeting. I think, you know, when, uh, when it comes to marketing, what is your target? What are you, who are you trying to reach? And I think a lot of times when it comes to marketing, we're not even starting there. We're just, we're just throwing out marketing and just hoping it sticks with somebody who's, who's <laughs> wants that message. Um, and targeting is the very first thing. Who am I trying to reach? Um, is my message on point, right? For, for that target. Am I, am I, do I have messaging that meets the consumer's needs? And you talked about how, you know, dealers are, are talking about pricing or messaging that might, may not meet their needs. I think COVID actually made marketing better because all of a sudden now you see marketing that's very specific, buy from home, sanitization, things that were very specific value props for consumers at that time. Um, and so I think messaging is uh, important. And the last thing, which is the most important, is actual tracking of ROI. And I think, once again, you, you, you see dealers wanting to learn from each other on what they're doing. And, I, and what happens with that is there's some new marketing channel. One dealer tries it. He tells all the other dealers. And guess what? All of a sudden, we're all doing that same marketing and the ROI starts to fade a little bit after, after time. So we got to look at our, our tracking to see, are we actually getting ROI out of this meeting that target is the message message, re, uh, you know, resonating and then continue to iterate. We constantly, a true car, we constantly test marketing, put it out there, see what happens, test, iterate, change. It's not just about putting marketing out there and then just saying, all right, I'm done. There's my campaign for the year. Right. So anyways, I'll, I'll let no, that's totally true. Lori, hey, jump in. Lori, you, know? I, I, you deal with so many leaders at the dealership and so much management and ownership. And I got to ask you a question. I'm probably going to get grilled the fact that I'm asking this question. <laughs> but should they really be the ones in charge of their marketing message? Because it seems like they just always kind of default to the easy button. They're like, eh, whatever the hell my manufacturer is doing, I'll run that. That's OK. <laughs> what, like. <laughs> Should management be in charge of marketing messages? What do you think? So I'm going to say that one's yes, that is absolutely loaded. So I'm going to dance. Are you guys ready to dance? <laughs> so, I'm going to go to a couple of things and I'm going to loop back. I'm not avoiding it, but we're going to loop back here. Carrie said something a few minutes ago. She was talking about the long game. I'm even, I've even just finished listening to Simon Sinek's The Infinite Game. And I, I think it's if there was one advisory I would give to any and all businesses, period, not just automotive, it would be 
however long you think your purview is right now, broaden it, expand it, deepen it, because it's not a today game. And even businesses that are like, we don't do that, they do in a different way. But in automotive, it's back to an EKG again. And it's not just every month, even though it's insane how we do that. It's Jason, my manager walks by my desk and it's just been three minutes. He's like, how's the Wilson deal? Like, like, <laughs> like it's just all these. So, so I'm going to circle back. I'm going to keep going here. So number one, in order to play a long game, you have to have a different playbook and you have to be okay with that from back to the top down. Number two, you have to change the place. So you've got it like, if you change the playbook, what are the plays? One of the core plays is communication communication, and then was subsequently then recognition. Because I can say we're playing a longer term game, but if I bust your chops every five minutes for something, right? And it's the language. It's not, it's not um, you know, hurry, hurry, all of the recognition for bell to bell. And Jason really busted it. It's like Jason is growing every day. He's getting better at what he's doing. And we're taking snapshots of people every night um, on the call today. 90 day rolling measures. And Kay, uh, Carrie was referencing, what is yielding results or not? We're too quick to pull the trigger one way or another mm -hmm. or delay there and leave the marketing campaign and let it rest far too long. So we've got to just take a more, um, a look with greater integrity and with uh, not just a microscope, but with that plays into our values and what we're trying to accomplish and check ourselves against that and not emotions because it's like, well, Carrie's the marketing person and but she never sold cars or Lori's the GM, but she, um, why is she doing it? So I don't think it's a matter of who should or shouldn't. It's what is the entire team committed to doing and what are they committed to doing when it's working or not? The final piece of this isn't just what's marketing doing or not, or who's making the decisions is because uh, Carrie had a lot of great points about the marketing itself and tracking that. But like when we look at the dealership, how well is what our marketing is going to look like being communicated to the very end users, the, the people that are meeting those customers. Hey, I see that you're doing this. And people are like, what? Oh, well, you should have, you should have looked at the 40,000 things we have online. No, it's your job as a leader at the dealership to not be a desk manager, but to be a sales coach and manager and arm your people with all of the information that they need to do their job well, for you, for them, and for those customers that are asking. So marketing, um, it's too isolated. Decision-making power gets too isolated. And then we have these people over here who haven't been communicated and groomed to do the best possible work that they can, but they get blamed when it doesn't happen. Or we blame the marketing company when they're simply reacting and responding to what you ask. So I think this is, I'd love to answer your question more straightforward, but this is the, this is the real layout. This is what's happening. And so I think it's a back to a timeout. They need to bring somebody in that can help them, that they'll listen to, that will help coordinate all of that without all of the emotions and without all of the ambiguity. And then everyone knows. And then it's always when they, we get to alignment and understanding that we start caring more for each other and our shared goals. So that's the answer to your question, who should make that decision? <laughs> that was an amazing dance, by the way. <laughs> I hope people uh, take note of that. That was that was amazing. <laughs> but but no, it, it does kind of come down to like if you know, Carrie, you were talking about earlier. Like like you have to know who your customer is, right? We we can't market at the customer anymore. You know, where we're just throwing things out there and just hoping something sticks. We have to market to the customer. And to do so, we have to know who they are. And if management is going to continue to be in charge of marketing efforts, then that needs to be their mindset. Like the, their Definitely. mindset has to be, I, I need to market that at the person to that person. So I need to take the time to actually understand who the heck I'm talking to and understand what's really important to them. I mean, look, pri look guys, we know price is always going to be important, but mm -hmm. we, we've learned over the last four months and it's not the most important thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's so funny. One of the, one of the, my favorite pieces of research I've ever been involved in um, from a consumer standpoint is when we ask consumers what um, value props that dealers message really stood out to them. You know, what drove them? You heard this message from a dealer. Did it cause you to select a dealer and was it unique or differentiated? And that was the two questions we asked consumers. 
And one of the learnings amongst many was that sometimes as in auto retail, our marketing is tied to our own ego. It's tied to what we want to hear, I'm right? So we're we're in the that. car on the way to work and we're hearing that radio and we're like, oh, I like hearing our dealership name on the radio, right? We see our ad and it makes us feel good and has nothing to do with necessarily what the consumer wants. And, and one of the examples, there were two different um, reasons for selecting dealer that we had on the survey. One was they were a family owned business and one was they were the number one uh, dealer in the area. Number one, four dealer, number one, accurate dealer. Those are common messages you hear, right? Dealers, you know, I've never heard anybody say long. number two. Number two, I right? Want some, I want somebody to come out and do a marketing campaign. Because <laughs> who doesn't like a number good number two? two? And I, I, I hate to break it to you, but those two different reasons I mentioned were, were not very high on the list of why a consumer selected a dealership. And especially on the number one dealership in the area, it wasn't very unique. It wasn't something unique or differentiated. So here we are thinking that these are the things consumers want to hear that I've been around this long, that we're family owned, and we're missing the point of giving them the real value prop of what we need. You've been around this long because you offer this value to consumers. And so I think, I think that's just an example of sometimes we fall short because we're really not solving consumer pain points. We're really emphasizing things that we, we think are, are important. You know, Carrie, I love all of that. The, the other thing as you're talking, when I, um, I was studying Google marketing a while back, maybe six months ago, and they really go into see, think, do, care. Most mm -hmm. of what we are talking to when we're marketing to customers um, as a, an automotive dealership, it's all to directly to the in-market shopper at that moment only. Mm -hmm. So you get the five alarm fires, ends today, you know, hurry, do this, do that. And you get that um, urgency, which nothing wrong with urgency, but you get this false sense of panic. And then if every day is a panicky day, then no day is a sales day. Like nothing is separate. So when we think about that, we think about like, what are the different places that people are in their shopping arc? And what is it about that dealership that's different? And so I would recommend 40% on urgency messages and then 20, 20, 20 on what are they thinking about um, uh, while they're looking for it? What do they do after they buy their car? What are the things that they're looking around for? So I would address that customer and I would still give the dealer autonomy to do 40% of their budget on the way they did it before. The other thing I would do, completely flipping the narrative here, is I would say whatever your current marketing budget is, is take 20% of the whole budget for two or three months and put that into building up your team and getting this whole process around marketing and communications and customer engagement right. Because if you invest that money in your team, they're the people that are the feet and the hands and the eyes and the mouths and the ears for delivering that message and bringing that experience to life. So for just two or three months, get a highly focused program in place where you're making sure that your people understand those marketing plays, understand how it benefits them, understands what the customers want to see, understands the different places customers are as they're looking. Then they're not upset when the customer doesn't respond in two or three days. They're like, ah, they're here on their journey and their journey is their own. It's not the journey that um, any of these companies showed us that they were on with these funnels. There's, they're in this circuitous journey. And I just need to like find out how to jump in the passenger seat or the back seat with them on the journey. And I need to be allowed permission to be with them on that journey by being mm -hmm. thoughtful and relevant. So those are my thoughts on marketing, uh, split that budget up a little bit, and then also make sure the team knows what's going on and really strengthen your team and their performance. Because at the end of the day, that's who's dealing, your customers are dealing with. And at the end of the day, sorry, bad news folks, they're still saying no five to one over saying yes. So we've got it. So, and a lot of that's the team that they're interfacing oh, with and the experience that they're having. In a huge way. I mean, I mean, Lori, it's, it's, it's hard for me to say it because being a marketer and, you know, managing millions and millions of dollars of ad spent every single, every single year. Um, I actually agree with you. I, I I've seen just too much wasted money, you know, spent on, 
not overly great experiences. And I, 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 I'm with you. I, now my operations manager is going to hate the fact he's going to hate. He's going to probably cut this piece out of the podcast. Um, but, 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 but it, it has to happen. Like, I mean, I, I want to see a bigger investment into the experience and then let's go market that experience. Right. I mean, and Carrie, you, you said it so poetically, you know, earlier about how we do it for, you know, ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think for a lot of owners out there where, you know, these big marketing budgets are being controlled, and managed by, you know, maybe their general manager or their GSM or, or somebody else is, you know, finding out, you know, simply asking the question, you know, how tell me about the customer you're marketing to. Because, I mean, I've seen, you know, GMs spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in listening to their voice on a radio. <laughs> you know but no, but i think no that, consequence there's no consequence if if it doesn't work there isn't it's an, ego, an emotional driven action right but but i think that 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 kind of also not just stops in our marketing efforts but also extends into our staffing efforts you know it, where in the past we marketed at the customer now we have to market to the customer now i feel like we've staffed for our benefit <laughs> right mm -hmm. we hire we hired uh superstars right we want superstars we want people that are gonna say you know but no but, but we're real customer friendly but you know if he's gonna grind them a little harder i'm okay with it you know so it's like i think we're, we have to get away from that superstar culture looking for that 30 to 40 car a month person and now we have to define well what does you know the customer who does the customer want to deal with i want to get your guys' thoughts actually on this carrie i'll, I'll start with you and then laurie ask you the same question is you know how do we evolve our staffing you know for the customer well it's interesting as you were talking um all i could can, i was thinking about relationship selling and how i think that 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 is where we need to evolve right is um you know, in the past, we've thought about how do we reach as many customers as possible or get as many leads as possible, or how do we close as many sales? But the long-term view is how do we build relationship and how do we close that trust gap that has always existed between consumers and, and dealers? And um, I think about a story, you know, I interviewed Ali Rita, the number one salesperson in the world months ago. And, and you learn so much from somebody like that, that has sold 14, 1500 cars in a year by themselves without taking one lead, without taking one off, right? He has no interest in that because he's, he's really thinking about the long game. He's involved in all of the associations and charities. He's so immersed in his community. And even when he brought somebody on as, as his second salesperson who's working underneath him, he picked his pool guy who happened to be immersed in the Spanish, Hispanic community. He didn't pick the pool guy because he was a superstar, because he had 20 years of experience in auto. In fact, he actually went the opposite way. He chose someone who wasn't. He could train and he can mold and he could teach. And he chose someone who was immersed in his community from a people standpoint. And this guy in his first couple months is selling 40 cars a month. Right. And so the, I think the lesson here is you're right. We've always focused on those superstars um, and we've promoted them even right because they sold the most cars when the, the fact is leadership isn't I, I'm a leader and I'm a vice president. And it's not because I can do what the people that work for me can do. I can lead them. I can guide them in strategy. I can move, remove hurdles. But the people that work for me are tactically better in certain aspects. And auto, we've never thought about it like that. We've picked people who were superstar salespeople and then made them the leaders. And they're really immature from a leadership standpoint. Um, and so I don't know if I answered your question, but I think we got to go back to relationship and we have to redefine what is a leader? A leader isn't somebody who can do the job themselves at the best level, but they can certainly lead, remove hurdles, and strategize. No, no, I think I think you you hit it really well. I mean, like we're having to evolve our staff. You know, every everything in our dealership is evolving. Our our, our leadership's evolving. Our marketing's evolving. Our management's evolving. Our staff. I mean, you know, look, dealerships had you know 30, 40, 50 people to choose from. 
and you know they furloughed or laid off so many and they kept this percentage and when you ask them why either knowingly or unknowingly there was a reason why and those are the ones that connected with the customers and that is what really i think drove them to succeed in the past previous couple of months but you know laurie i'd like to get kind of your thoughts on how do we continue to evolve our mindset around staffing at our dealership so this one's um one that's really close to my heart we have got to hire for attributes not for successes that people say that they had or skills that they cannot even prove that they own. Um, like you say, CRM, I'll have, do you know how to run a CRM? Everybody says yes. And I say, so I started this about 10 years ago, maybe 12 now. When, this was actually 12 years ago, guys, you'll get a kick out of this. So somebody, so when they come in for the interview, I've already asked them to email me something else. I wanted to see what it looks like. I have them sit down at a computer and this is for any role, manager roles, anything. They say that they can do something. I'm like, fantastic. Here's a customer profile. Um, please just pop this into the system. It won't mess with our CRM. Just get this info popped into the system. After that, run out, snap a picture of the red Mustang on the corner of the used one. My niece wants to see it. Add some notes about that. And then what do you ask them to do is, oh, by the way, then we're going to go through a few mock-up phone calls. We're just going to talk about anything you want. You want to talk about orange ties? We'll talk about orange ties. And so then we go from there and we find out how, how do they really act in the moment? Like, are they resistant and angry that you asked them to do something? Do they do it quickly, even if they did it wrong? <laughs> did they know how to do those things? So that's just one small little thumbnail of the kind of thing that, that we need to look at. Because we'll say to a GM, I'd like to know what does the what the, what are the metrics for what a, G, a good GM looks like. Like, how do you know? Like when you're a store and you got 15 that want to work at your store, if you're lucky, right? How do you know? And so this becomes where the person themselves is more important than almost anything because if you're a good owner and you have a good ecosystem around them, you should be able to lift that leader to what they need, how they need to express that. Like Carrie was saying, she's a vice president. so. She could go to another place. I am not saying that she should go, <laughs> but she could go to another place and take her leadership attributes and her history and her performance and her coaching. She can take that there and she can learn what the role requires there and the nuances of that place and the idiosyncrasies. And Martha's the one that leaves the stuff in the fridge that's smelly. <laughs> She'll learn that, you know, but, but what she needs to do is be a great leader. And what we do instead is we promote people. You're talking about staffing here, Jason. We promote people into roles that they're ill-equipped for, and it's not their fault. But being ill-equipped, not knowing the skills is one thing. But when they're ill-equipped with the personal attributes and the professional attributes that we need, you're playing a game that you cannot win. And then you'll have people under them that cannot win because these people are operating out of the wrong set of um they're using the wrong tools. They don't have the right reason that they're doing it. And you'll never quite be able to put your finger on it. But again, you'll always see that EKG. They're, they have a good month and they're bathing in the glory. They have a bad month and they're blaming everybody else. So, um, so leadership starts at the top, but it starts with a plan to address it. And it starts with role cl reclarification, um, even how you write your ads, it, right, it goes through your entire hiring process. Do you onboard them and or do you just they show up? Every dealership I've come to has had people show up to work and nobody even knew why that, they didn't even know who they were or why they were there. And then it's the ongoing care to keep and me maintain that customer, that customer, internal customer, that employee as a, not just a member of the place, but a thriving member who feels purposeful, who feels recognized, and who feels the shared commitment that everyone has to continuous improvement and the, and the accountability that goes with that. So that's what I think about staffing. No, I, I look, I mean, moving forward, if, if we don't put, I mean, you know what? I'm just gonna say it. I, I, mean, I think we actually need to put the staff in front of the customer. Well, absolutely. I, I, I just, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking of like, right? I mean, yeah. collectively between the three of us, we, we visited thousands and thousands of dealerships. And, you know, I'm just thinking of a pattern. And, you know, the pattern that I see with the dealerships that are, I would say the top 1% 
of success. And, and that may be profitability and maybe not overall large volume, but just, just profitability is happy, happy staff, real leadership, happy staff. And that just kind of seems to overflow into this thing that we call the customer experience. And it's like, we're, somehow we're trying to define the customer experience with this piece of technology and we're gonna define it with this, but in reality, it's it's that it's that staff and it's the leadership and it's putting the customer at the center of our, of our marketing efforts and our leadership development and our staffing efforts and ultimately our culture, which I think kind of just encompasses the whole thing. Now, um, I, know, yeah. I, know, I know it's towards the tail end of our, our time today. I'm sure we could probably go for another hour. <laughs> It feels like it's here. been about five minutes. I know, right? Just went <laughs> like that. But but before I, I let let you ladies go, I want to ask you just one last question. It's my favorite question to ask. Um, you can answer it any way you like. All right, uh, Carrie, you're you're up first. If you were able to change one thing in our industry, what would that be and why? Oh wow, I'm going to give a timely answer. Might have been different even a couple months ago. But I want our industry to be more diverse. And I'm not just talking about women because we've talked about women a lot, but I mean, in terms of women and race, sexual orientation, uh, mentality. I think that when we were talking about people, we were just talking about people and how we hire people. One of the challenges we have is we just hire ourselves. (laughs) And we wonder, well, women don't really apply here or people of color don't really apply here. And we really haven't looked at the internal culture. We haven't looked at what we're putting out there. All of these things are sometimes barriers to attracting a more diverse staff. And I would say in 2020, the fact that we still are talking about that in an industry where half the customers are women and in certain areas, a huge percent are different cultures to have a staff that all looks the same to me is just, that's a crime. So to me, I, I'm just, that's very timely uh, and maybe a little cliche coming from me, <laughs> but I think um, we need a diverse staff, not just from a Kumbaya standpoint, but from a mentality standpoint, bring some new blood in new philosophies and that that's going to solve a lot of the problems that we have in the business. You know what, Carrie, I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's, it's total key to success, but I will say mm-hmm. some of the most successful dealerships I have had the opportunity to consult with had a very diverse, a very yeah. diverse uh, staff uh, management team, uh, both uh, men and, and women and uh, especially here in Toronto, we're in a melting pot. Uh, it literally yeah. can go neighborhood by neighborhood. You can have six different ethnic backgrounds within your dealership's PMA. So here we get we get a lot of that, but that truly does bring into the success of the dealership. And again, what it is, it's 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 um it's not only good for us as a team, but we were kind of saying earlier, is staffing for that customer. Yes, and 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 that's. It's you're understanding your customer and you're staffing for them and diversifying is absolutely important to do so. Mm-hmm. Lori, if you were able yep. to change one thing on our industry, and I'm sure you'd want to change a bunch, but I'll give just, <laughs> just one this time. <laughs> what would that one thing be and why? Well, I do want to change a lot um, because it's healthy for us and it's time. And what Carrie's referencing, you know, I have a lump in my throat every time we're all talking about this, right? Mm-hmm. So I want to solve that. But here's how I believe we solve to that and so many other things simultaneously is um, even the dealers who are the best people, but that were born into the industry, right? It's time. This is not the car business. This is business. This is a, these need to be run more like, not like uh, Frank's, you know, repair shop. They need to be run with the professionalism and the structure of business not the car business. We need to hire for roles as carefully as they do in corporate America. There need to be the same screening. There's not not emotional, not off the cuff. Oh, by the way, I just hired Bill Smith for the desk. I just put in this, oh, we got a new GM coming around. We're getting rid of this one, getting rid of that one. Marketing budgets, everything. All of this rolls up under, under an umbrella of deciding that you're going to operate, not just say you are, but operate as a business that's committed to the long game, as Carrie said, and that gets committed to all of the things that fall under their umbrella. Mm -hmm. And that's going to mean 
hiring leaders for their attributes, not for boy, they were a big that Jim Smith, he was a big deal over at Dick Doodlehead's motor <laughs> down the road because, because this guy is going to be that same guy that you saw before. You And you need to get comfortable stepping out of the boundaries that we've unintentionally or intentionally mm-hmm. placed around our heads for who we're hiring and why and what, what success looks like when we look at an industry that's faced with the highest attrition, the, one of the lowest in customer satisfaction, the most spend for the least margin. Like it's insane, the corner that we've painted ourselves into, but it all starts in our minds and in our hearts and then in our words and our actions, right? So it's leadership at the top. I would wish for better leadership and a commitment to better leadership. Even if we're flawed, if we're trying, we're not as flawed as we were yesterday. So we just fail a little bit better on our way to it. And then what Carrie's talking about is like, oh, what, are you kidding me? We don't even have to think about that because of (laughs) course we're doing it. We don't have to think about all these other things. So I would say set the sail in the right direction with the right team on board. Hey, can I just add the the superstar of of today may not be the superstar of yesterday. Good point. You know, emotional intelligence has now become the new IQ. And I'm so glad because... I mean, I did go to college, but I, I, if you saw my, my GPA, it wasn't necessarily 4.0. So I'm glad of EQs have become more important in success. And so if you're an IQ person or if you're a hustle person or an hours person or any of those things that auto retail has, has traditionally based success off of, um, you're going to you're going to you're going to come into a rude awakening when you have to deal with my 13 year old. Cause she's, she, she thinks differently than me. She, she's in different places when it comes to social, like, so we got to shift with that or, or unfortunately you're going to be at a disadvantage. Yeah. And jumping off of that, Carrie, a friend of mine's doing this whole series. I should show you this. She did a Ted talk recently on AQ adaptability quotient, Ooh, right? I've never heard of that. Yeah. So, um, so then we take all of that uh, and, and you got to have EQ to get there. Right. Okay. But some people Sounds don't good. have that that extra bit of DNA to do that. But so like, how, how do they handle situations when they look at what we're in the middle of? And again, it's not just hours and muscle and adrenaline. It's like, what are their skills? What do they do? How do they act and respond? So yep. It's time. It's all leadership folks. It's just all about leadership. And I, and I appreciate the chance that we can have this wide open unscripted conversation about this, Jason, because I think conversations it's key. If I said where, where to start, it's, it starts with conversations. Yep. And, and and hopefully That's- the people that are out there watching, listening right now, you know, take some of that and start having some conversations of their own. Um, gosh, we've touched on so much, you know. But you know, I mean, yeah. Carrie, you, you said it earlier, you know, you know, for us to kind of evolve, you kind of have to hit that rock bottom, you yes. know, so that you can kind of build back up. And man, I'm really hoping that people will listen to this, start having conversations of their own, you know, about how they're going to evolve their leadership, their marketing, their management, their staff, and their communications effort, the diversification of their team. You know, um, gosh, there's just so so much here. Uh, for everyone out there that's watching and listening right now, and would love to connect with you too. Uh, what is the best way to do so? Carrie, I'll start with you. I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook primarily from a social standpoint. So look at Carrie Wise and you'll find me. Uh, you can also email me at kwise at truecar.com. And if you're interested in our program, I got to give a little plug for that. It's truecar.com slash dealer. And you can find out more information. Awesome. Hey, Lori, for yourself, best way to connect with you? So LinkedIn Lori is what I get called a lot. <laughs> yeah, she's we'll amazing. <laughs> we'll ride with that. So if you go to linkedin.com slash in slash Lori D. Foster, I use my real name, L-A-U-R-I-E D. Foster. You can find me on LinkedIn or if you just type in Lori in automotive, that usually works. And then my mobile for text and everything is 269 269- Two one seven zero four one four. My website's pretty powerful now. It's um, www.fosterstrategiesgroup.com. Strategies is plural because we've got more than one. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Shift taglines, like just built it. in. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should have called myself strategies with Jason. So I know the way she said that, she sounded Jason. so, it was like another I know. accent. I was like, oh, that's you know? very cool. I'm fancy. Ooh, let me put my I pinky up. I'm to go back to Europe. I'm tired of not being able to travel. <laughs> so I'll just talk about random accents here. <laughs> well, ladies, thank you so much for your time today. This has been so much fun. You have yourself an amazing day, all right? Thank you, Jason. Thanks. Thanks, Lori. 
Thanks for tuning in to the Strategy Mob Podcast with your host, Jason Harris. Don't want to miss new content? Be sure to sign up to be a mobster at strategymob.com to stay in the know. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Happy podcasting.